Hi guys, welcome to the mini lecture series on thermochemistry. So as the name implies, this lecture series is going to explore the energy and heat uh, transfer processes as they pertain to chemical reactions. Before jumping in, I want to frame this discussion by stating that you know thermochemistry is actually a subset of a broader physical theory called thermodynamics. And thermodynamics is a very unique and fascinating uh, uh, set of concepts that basically lay the foundation for energy transfer processes more generally. And they were in fact developed far before we had any conceptions of modern day chemistry. Um, however, despite that fact, these thermodynamic principles that we're going to be talking about um, in this uh, you know, next couple lectures are actually have essentially stood the test of time despite the fact that we've learned about atoms, molecules, quantum theory, and all the other advances that have come with it, the basic truths and the basic concepts underlying thermodynamics have not been overthrown. Okay, so to appreciate this, let's answer this question of thermodynamics um, you know, by looking at the historical development of the theory itself. So thermodynamics was in fact developed to describe energy transfer processes in these guys, steam engines. Okay, So once again, as I said, far before knowledge of atoms, molecules, and modern day chemistry. Now, the cool thing is, is that despite the fact of its, you know, rather old beginnings and, um, you know, the core intended purpose of its study, the same energy transfer principles that govern the you know, relationships and the behavior of energy in a steam engine actually hold for energy transfer processes more generally, essentially across the board. So an energy transfer process that'll be of you know, much more direct interest to us as chemists um, you know, and biochemists is to look at the energy transfer involved with breaking down food stuff that we ingest through a series of biochemical reactions to ultimately produce energy that we use to maintain uh, essentially life. Okay? And so the thermodynamical principles understand, um, underpinning energy transfer in this context are exactly the same as those principles that under, uh, that, um, for which thermodynamics was initially developed, namely for the steam engine. And so with thermochemistry, as I said, we're looking at a subset of thermodynamics. And one of the core questions that we are going to be looking at is essentially trying to quantify and predict um, energy or heat that is evolved, given off, or absorbed during the course of chemical reactions. So, of course, if you burn uh, octane, you're going to get heat as a byproduct of this reaction. So energy is released when you carry out the combustion of octane or when you form this iron oxide compound that is formed for in many uh, chemical reactions that are used in hand warming devices. All right? So in both of these example reactions, heat is given off or there is a, uh, a transfer of heat. Um, and what we want to be able to do in this chapter is develop some tools and principles to help quantify and understand those energy change processes. In order to do that, uh, we're going to introduce first a couple of key definitions and terms. And what you'll find with all three of these that we're going to look at first, energy, work, and heat, is that they are terms that we use in our everyday speech. However, the precise scientific definition um, is, is oftentimes different. So it's important to pay close attention to how, what, what each one of these terms means uh, from a scientific perspective. So the first one up, let's look at energy. Okay, so energy is defined as the capacity to do work, and it comes in two flavors, kinetic and potential. Okay, so those of you that have taken a previous uh, physics course will uh, probably find these terms familiar. Basically, kinetic energy is the energy due to motion, and potential energy is the energy due to composition. Okay. So energy due to motion, as we saw in our discussion of ideal gases, is intimately tied in with this concept of temperature, which we'll explore later. And inner potential energy due to uh, position or composition is a sort of chemical energy that's associated with the positions of electrons and nuclei. Okay? So to look at this in, in the context of an example, let's talk about liquid water. Okay, so liquid water has a, a bunch of these water molecules constantly moving around and they're going to have an associated kinetic energy. 
And then they're also going to have a potential energy that's associated with the specific arrangement of those individual oxygen and hydrogen atoms. So to see this, let's look at a little simulation. So what I'm showing here is a simulation that uh, shows water molecules in a liquid solution, right? So just floating around pure water in this case. And we can see that these molecules are moving around, they're rotating around, they're vibrating. All of these uh, you know, motions are uh, uh, associated with just that, atoms and molecules moving around through space, okay? And the amount of kinetic energy that this system has is essentially gonna govern how much of this motion occurs. Right? And then each and every one of these individual water molecules, the oxygen and hydrogen atoms that uh, comprise it, are effectively um, you know, going to be defining the associated potential energy. Okay, so what I'm now gonna do is introduce uh, another term that we're gonna find extremely useful as we move through this chapter, and this is the notion of internal energy. So I wanted to note the internal energy of a system using this uh, you know, capital E, and this internal energy is gonna be defined as the sum total of all the kinetic and potential energies of all the atoms and uh, you know, molecules that comprise the system. So if we look at our little sample of water again in our um, you know, simulation, if we were to add up all of the translational, rotational, vibrational kinetic energies associated with each and every one of these atoms, and then we were to look at all of the potential energy uh, associated with the uh, position of each one of those atom types, the bond lengths, bond angles, all that stuff, and we just sum it all together, look at the total energy, that is going to be the internal energy of the system. Okay, now look at the final part of this definition. Right, so internal energy is what we call a state function. So this is a phenomenon that you might not be familiar with um, if in terms of the, you know, the specific definition here. So let's take a minute and throw that up here. So a state function is a function that depends only on the state of the system and not how the system arrived at that state. Okay, so how's that for an abstract definition? Okay, well, Good news, this is actually a, a phenomena that you're very familiar with, all right? And it's best illustrated through an example. Let's say that we are going on a hike, okay? And there's two different paths up the mountains, okay? So what you're, we're starting off at some baseline point. We'll call that zero feet of elevation, okay? And when we go up to the top of this mountain along this hike, there's two different paths. There's a long path, we'll call it path A here, it's a 12 hour path, go, get, or a 12 mile path to go all the way to the top of that mountain. Okay? Then there's a steeper, more direct path over here on the side that goes essentially straight up the side of the mountain. Call that path B. Okay? So certainly path A and path B are very different. Right? 12 mile journey versus a five mile journey that's much more steep is a, you know, a very different hiking experience, a very different path. However, if you look at the change in altitude for both of these paths, they are both 10,000 feet, okay? So a change in altitude is also a state function. Once you get to the top of the mountain, your change in altitude was 10,000 feet regardless of how you got there. In fact, you could walk up halfway the mountain, come back down you know, a third of the way, go back up a half of the way, come back down a quarter, and then walk to the top. And it wouldn't matter. At the end of the day, wherever you end up and wherever you start are going to be the only factors that uh, you'll go into determining that change in altitude. Okay? And so it turns out energy, internal energy, um, is the exact same, behaves the exact same way. And we're going to find that extremely useful as we move through different applications. Okay, but before we go into all the applications, we want to get the rest of these terms defined. So the next term on our agenda was work. Okay? So work is a form of energy transfer. And now remember, when I defined energy, I said it was the capacity to do work, okay? So energy is the capacity to do work, and work is a form of energy transfer, and it's the result of a force acting through a distance, and this energy transfer is gonna involve macroscopic modes of motion, okay? So a simple example here, carrying a box, 
you know, up the stairs. So there's obviously a force being applied to this box, okay? And there's an energy transfer process, you know, the food stuff that was eaten, the chemical energy is being burned, you know, the individual carrying this box in a somewhat awkward configuration here up this flight of stairs is transforming chemical potential energy into gravitational and kinetic uh, potential energy, um, you know, gravitational potential and kinetic energy of this box. Okay, and we can see this process occurring. We can see that box moving up to a higher point of potential gravitational potential energy. Okay, so in a chemical example here, we could look at, um, you know, sort for example, the expansion of a gas in a piston chamber and watching that gas, you know, lift up some little weights. In both cases, we're be able to see a box being lifted up, see little weights being lifted up. Okay. And so that's the hallmark of macroscopic motion, right? You can see those objects being lifted. So energy is being transferred and you can see the result. Okay, now heat on the other hand is also a form of energy transfer, okay? But it's involving microscopic modes of motion, okay? We already know that heat um, and these, these microscopic motions that are associated with atoms and molecules are associated with temperature. And this temperature, um, as we saw in previous lectures, gives us a direction of energy transfer. So energy is always gonna be transferred from systems with high temperature to systems of low temperature. And of course, if two objects have the same temperature, then there's no net transfer of energy. So to appreciate this, let's look at a, another little simulation here where we are seeing the temperature of this sample of water molecule gases increase. And we can see all the little gas molecules move around faster and faster as that temperature goes up, okay? So increasing temperature corresponds to an increase in the internal energy of the system, increase in the kinetic energy very dramatically here as evidenced by faster and faster motions. Okay. And it's important we make this distinction uh, between heat versus temperature. Okay, So temperature is a measure of the thermal energy within a sample. Okay, So higher temperature, more thermal energy, lower temperature, less thermal energy. Okay, But heat is a transfer of energy. Okay, So heat is a transfer of thermal energy. So just like work, heat and work are both energy transfer processes. Right, The difference is that heat involves microscopic motions. So if we look at our simulation again here, right, and, and we think about it at a macroscopic level, if we weren't zoomed in here, obviously we can't see molecules moving faster. We can see the result of the temperature increasing, but we cannot observe molecules directly. So the energy transfer process that's occurring as we're heating up this sample, right, is energy transfer involving microscopic modes of motion that we don't see. Okay, and then a couple, two more terms that we need to define before we're ready to, to jump into thermal chemistry proper. Um, and these definitions are really gonna help uh, just to, uh, help aid the discussion, facilitate the discussion of the study of different thermodynamic systems, the different thermochemical systems, okay? And so these terms are known as system and surroundings, okay? So as the name implies, you know, the system is just, it can be, it could be anything. Any part of the universe that we are focusing on, okay? So it could be a chemical reaction, it could be a piece of metal, gaining energy, losing energy, could be anything, right? So denoted here in blue, right, that, that part of the universe that we're focusing on, and then we're gonna define the surroundings as literally everything else in the universe, okay? So everything uh, outside of that uh, chemical reaction or that system that we're studying. So of course, if you add both that system and surroundings together, then you get everything in the universe, okay? So if we look at the total energy, all right, of this system, and we denote that by E with a little subscript there, and the total energy of everything else, right, in the universe, and we add them together, then of course, we are going to arrive at the total energy of the universe. 
And so we're going to see as we move into the next lectures why I'm, uh, you know, painstakingly developing all these definitions and putting forward, um, you know, these, these notions of energy, work, and heat. Um, but before we jump into these applications, I want to do a quick summary here. So we basically have introduced this concept of energy, right, as this capacity to work. And we've said that it comes in two flavors, kinetic and potential, right? And we've defined the internal energy, E, as the sum total of all of that kinetic and potential energy, right? We talked about how changes in that internal energy, represented by a delta E, are path independent because internal energy is a state function, just like altitude, okay? We talked about how work and heat are both forms of energy transfer, okay? The difference being that work involves macroscopic modes of motion, whereas heat involves those microscopic modes of motion, okay? And finally, we introduce the concept of a system as the part of the universe we're focusing on, the surroundings is everything else outside of it. And so, of course, when we add the energy of both those together, we arrive at the total energy of the universe. In the next lecture video, we are now going to talk about uh, physical laws that directly pertain to the energy of the universe, which is the so-called first law of thermodynamics.